FNR, Football Nation Radio. Bucianos, no call! Score! Salamini for Paul. Paul on the run. Shoots. 2 0. Lazanowski with the free kick. Launches the rocket! Trimboli, what vision! Bath blasts. Yes! A ditch! Buljevic. Here's Bazanic. Pioneers with George Denikian and George Kotsanis on FNR Football Nation Radio. G2, it's that time of the week. Good evening, G1. Uh, can I just say it's that time of the week? Yeah, you can say it as much as you like. And more importantly, we're, we're, hour, we're so back on air. air. We're back on air, we're uh, live. <laughs> live, all right. We're, we're, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, um, all day we've had a power outage, uh, internet, some... some some person uh, stood on the wire. inconveniently <laughs> drove the through a PowerPoint, and uh, I thought we're going to have to do this next week. Our special guest is the a one winger. and only Another winger. winger. Where do you find union them? Is, they're easy to find. In the wingers' union, it's a camaraderie, it's a brotherhood. There's a lot of us, and it's important you that know, our stories The get, propaganda get is so thick on the ground. I said to someone this morning, Goran Lozanowski, uh, the former NSL winger and uh, coach is coming on, is going to be our guest. Mm. And the guy wrote me back, he went, oh, God's going to be on. He goes, he's a legend. I said, well, send me some dope. And all I heard was, I can't, I can't, everything I know about him is R-rated. That's not the sort of thing I expected no, from a family man. Not on a winger. No, I can't go, mate. He says, <laughs> but ask him about, hang on, Ask him about his coloured boots. He was before his time. <laughs> now, this has come from uh, one of the guys who knows all about boots. He's a Nike excellent. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll drop him in. It's David Clarkson. So tell us about the coloured boots, uh, Goran. G1, G2, thanks is. for having us. And the point is... <laughs> <laughs> you wingers, you speak a special language, eh? You know, we do. We do. We're, um, unfortunately, we are, we're creative. Don't give me unfortunate. No, we're, we're, yeah, we're all creative. It doesn't George, wear well with so. me. You know, G1 and G2, you've got to understand, like, you know, when you're a winger, you have to be creative, otherwise you get criticised for not defending, so... But anyway... But get on with it. Games. Born in <laughs> Melbourne, no excuses. 11th of January, 74. You played your junior football with Altona Gate Soccer Club, which is, of course, now Altona Magic. What Correct. colour boots did you wear at Altona Magic? <laughs> Back in those days, everything was black, George. So, um, no, look, uh, yeah, Altona, as a junior, was, it was a great club and a thriving club back in those days, and uh, everyone wore black boots back then. And you only went to Altona because Bill, your father, mm. super influence in your life, mm. you used to love watching him play on a Sunday morning, striding around, making the opposition look like ordinary, <laughs> is that right? Yeah, my father played the game. Obviously, he was, a, he was an amateur footballer back in those days. What position play. did Dad play? He was a fullback. He was, uh, just a, he was a hard nut fullback. Yeah, yeah. I used to watch him uh, get into some What nasty did he do tackles. to wingers? He used to break their legs. <laughs> 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 did did he the spend legs. many a time, uh, you know, on the sidelines watching because uh, you know the ref referees would have been kinder or tougher on him in those days? No, they're actually kinder. They used to let those things happen, happen though, back in those days. Is that right? Yeah, so, but um, obviously the game's changed a lot now with those nasty tackles these days. You've been sitting on the sidelines for a while. Uh, so, uh, do you remember any tackles around the knees? <laughs> No, there was plenty. There was plenty. Um, you know, obviously, growing up at Altona Magic uh, back in those days, was uh, I used to watch the senior team a lot. And um, tell you what, there's some nasty tackles I saw as, a, as, a, as a junior back in those days. But the game was a lot more physical. Did that frighten you at all? Did that put you off the game? You know what, it did. But it obviously, I think it made our generation a lot tougher. Definitely, uh, it, you know, expectation was a lot higher to make sure that we're going to handle these these rough tackles, and if not, jump them, skip them. Uh, speaking of skipping, G2, Katsanis, fellow winger of yes. the same club, <laughs> um, he used to have a, a great uh, source of confidence any time he nutmegged a fullback. Mm -hmm. Did you have that absurd notion that you had to go round the fullback a second time after you nutmegged him? The first time? No, I never did. If I did do that, my coach would have taken me off. But <laughs> well, if you had played under me, I would have made sure you did go back and beat them three times. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, mean, look, I, I did come across a few players back in my day that would do those sort of things, but uh, it did end up uh, pretty after the game. But um... yeah, look, G two every week wants to take you back to the very beginning. Mm. So you know, G two, take let's it. Let's go with it. All right, go with it. Mate. I want to know. Take obviously, obviously, that. Altona Magic did play, or well, Altona Gate at the time played a big mm. part in, the, in your dad, but do you remember your very, very first football soccer memory? 
Yeah, probably my first football soccer memory would have been um, watching, I think, the World Cup, 78. I think that was probably my, my first journey. The Kempis was, uh, one? The Kempis one, yeah. Uh, oh. My father had me in front of the TV. And, oh, yeah, dinner. Yeah, it was, it was crazy having that World Cup. I think that's probably where I fell in love with the game, um, watching that World Cup in 78. And um, then probably a year later, I was, I was playing the game. So um, that's where my love came. And you know, when people talk about World Cups, uh, that was my first experience in 78, and um, I can't forget it. Yeah, that was a good World Cup. That mm. fact that you're a winger, people <laughs> probably don't know that as a junior you weren't a winger, were you? No, I wasn't. Uh, obviously, you and I were having that conversation outside earlier on. I grew up playing as a as a right fullback uh, for most of my junior career. Most talented people started as fullbacks. Did they? Yeah, yeah I'm not too sure about that. Oh, I absolutely. <laughs> I can vouch for that. I gravitated from left fullback to goalkeeper. <laughs> well, I went to centre that's, that's forward, not left wing. Left yeah, you know, I, I played. Hey, I played left wing at one spot in time. <laughs> so, so that's um, when I was fast. So back in my day, I think when I when I was playing, I was playing with older guys. So I was a little bit younger than most. So. Uh, first probably four or five years I played as a fullback and then dropped down to my age group as the club grew and got a lot more juniors involved at the club and uh, ended up saying to myself this is a bit too easy for me now so I, I went into central midfield and um, tried to challenge myself in the central area. Did you have the engine? Um, I thought I did. Yeah, maybe <laughs> people had the <laughs> Different opinions. Look, I, I think I think back in those days, uh, the engine wasn't uh, as big as what you know, people talk about it now these days. I think the game wasn't as quick back then. But, um, it was all about just improving yourself, I think, technically and understanding the game as, as, as a junior. And I think that's what these days coaches are teaching kids to make sure they understand the game better. Uh, you went to the AIS. Mm. You're one of the lucky group that actually got to one of the centres for excellence when we had one. Yeah, yeah. Um, the yeah. French have, I think, about 10 of them across the country. That's and uh, it's a reason why they're champions of the world. Yeah. Uh, they have one federation that runs football in France. Mm. And they have you know, 80 million, 60 million people. Mm. Isn't it amazing? We have a country this size. Yeah. We have about 55 federations. Yeah. And no centre of excellence. And, and no centres of excellence. <laughs> yeah. Look, what does that say? Because you, you, you can speak uh, for that um, um, uh, that year, the generation. Uh, that generation yeah. of boys who did go. I'll, just take, I'll, I'll take you back a little bit. Yeah, um, go. But back in those days, obviously, we had big squads. And um, everyone used to fight out. You play for your region. Yep. You know, obviously, you had the Western region, the Northern region, Central. And you take one another on. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you play for your region, and from your region, you get selected into the state squad. Were you always a constant member? Were you a consistent member of the state squad? So I was a c consistent member of the, of the regional squad. Yep. Um, and then in the state squad, for some reason, for the first, from under 12s, 13s, 14s, 15s, I just kept missing out. Okay. And um, I kept saying to myself, geez, am I that bad? Or am I improving? And they couldn't spell your name. Yeah, probably that was the case, <laughs> George. Right. Who knows? That's what but, I, was told. Uh, I used to always have a discussion with my father. My father said to me, "Look, you know, there's probably you know, bits and pieces happening behind the scenes that you probably don't know about, and you probably don't need to know about." He goes, "Don't stress about it. Yeah. It's meant to be. It's meant to be." Good. good so good. then one year, um, I made the B squad. They had a B team, and they said that they'll play in like an regional tournament, and we got excited. And back in those days, George. All I really wanted was that buffalo white bag. It was a leather <laughs> buffalo yeah, white Victoria bag. Do you remember it? No, you remember it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you got one, see? I, I bought it on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> so, back in those days, and that's what we used to go to uh, football training, and if you had a white buffalo bag, you were a superstar. Yeah. And everyone wanted one. So, you know, that's all I ever wanted. I just wanted to get that white buffalo bag. And I did get it one year, and it got taken away from us because they ended up cancelling the B team. Oh, yeah, so, so my heart was torn. Game. Yeah, pretty much. Heart and so then what happened the following year, I think actually the same year, the tournament got binned. It was meant to be up in Perth, the state championships, and something happened, for a reason. So Ron Smith, back in those days, was going to all yep. states and doing trial processes. And so my state, uh, my regional coach said to me, listen, I advise you to go to the trials. And I said to him, where is it? He said to me, in Monash. I said, yeah, fine, Monash is from Deerba. <laughs> And uh, he started laughing. I said, look, I've got to work it out. We'll try and get one of our parents to take us. So the majority of us went. Uh, we had a two-day camp, great experience. Ron Smith was unbelievable, just you know, great experience back then as a six-year-old kid to have this um, trial process with Ron, and he had so much knowledge back then. And um, there was a lot, a lot of kids that got selected. You know, he selected 30 kids from Victoria, and out of that 30, there was probably 10 kids that had never played for Victoria before. So he obviously saw something different in those kids that never played for the state. He before. probably wasn't coming from a political 
Probably George. Probably. So, you know, that opened up the door for myself yeah. and you know, a handful of other players and ended up getting a scholarship while I was there and uh, I couldn't be more happier because I think that sort of made me grow and become the player that I needed to be. And that's the AIS scholarship you were talking scholarship. about? Yeah. How long were you away for? 18 months. 18 months. Yeah. I can remember George Kostopoulos saying to me he was um, uh, in a rare spot because he was one of the original uh, group that was uh, brought in yeah. uh, in that inaugural year mm. uh, and of course much of the uh, facilities that you're very comfortable with mm. uh, they didn't quite have they had to do a little bit of uh, boarding in different places yep. until everything was sorted but he thought it was a, a, ter a tremendous uh, opportunity away from the family yep. uh, to mature to, exactly. to clear your head and get a sense of uh, just what's required to be the best possible footballer you could be. Yeah, absolutely right, George. I mean, look, it, it, it made you obviously a lot more independent. Yep. Um, having a, a common house where you had 20 players from all over Australia. And they also the together. cream of the crop, yeah? Well, I mean, it's always meant to be the cream of the crop. Yeah. You know, obviously, it's up to, to you know, obviously, back then, with Ron choosing the cream of the crop that he thought he could work with and yep. improve and be, make, make them young Socceroos and, I suppose, Oliroos and Socceroos eventually. So that was part of his job role. And, um, I mean, look, the position we were in was, was exceptional. And sometimes you look back at things and you probably say, this, I probably should have worked harder and get more out of it. You <laughs> know what I mean? Because it was, it was fun times. As much as we were working hard, it was fun times. We had a great time. Tell us about some of the people who were with you. Uh, in, that, in that era, with um, obviously Kevin Musket, who's currently coaching Victory. He was, okay, uh, what was he like? Come on, come on, come on. We well, 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 get two of the two of defenders, right? Yeah, yeah I, 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 was, I, was tell, I was telling G2 before, yeah, I was saying to him, um, Kevin and I were, were playing centre backs. Um, when I was you were competing? Playing, we played together. So. And left I, I left centre, played, right centre. I never played centre back in my life. And back then, Steve O'Connor, who was a centre back for Socceroos, what a star, what a star what he star. was. He was our coach and he taught me how to become a, a good centre back and how to win headers. And I never headed a ball in my life. And he said to me, Goran, he goes, you're Macedonian, you've got a head that should be winning headers and you just should be, become a centre back. And I said to him, Love it. whatever it may be, I said, let's do it. So back in those days, Ryan used to say, it's always good to know four or five different positions because if you ever get called up for the national team, they you can play. Yeah. So Plug that, and play. That was part of our education at the OS was, you know what, you've got to learn other positions, otherwise you're not going to give yourself any chance of being a soccer root in the future. What did you make of Kevin Musket at the time? Did you think he, he had the steel and he was going to be the sort of player, or the, have the career that he's had, yeah, both I mean, as a player and coach. Look, Kevin and I were quite close as, as just junior players. Obviously, we, play, we competed against each other from um, opposition clubs as juniors, but at the same time, when we were in the, in the regionals together, he was always a leader. Kevin always had that in him to be a leader. He was very boisterous in the park. He led, by example, um, even off the park. And he always had that in him. And I think they were moulding him to become the next captain of the young Socceroos and further forward. So. I think that's what national team coaches do, and that's what all these coaches do. Too. They find ex, they identify ex individuals, and they say, "Well, he so could, could be pretty much." And, yeah, and Kevin yeah. was one of them, and you could see Kevin be having having a stellar career, and which he did, which he did. So you, with Steve O'Connor and Ron, yep. as you're talking now, I'm learning mm. for some stuff about it. So yep. would they have been planting seeds, do you reckon, for you when you were going to be a coach? The stuff that were you starting to, you know what I mean? Like, mm. obviously at the time the you weren't thinking you were a young young fella, but. They would have planted some seeds that would have helped you when you went into coaching. I, th I think you're right. Um, you probably don't realise it uh, as, as a 16, 17 year old kid being in that process because you're just so excited and all you're doing you is training. Play. Yeah. yeah, you just want to play and yeah. train. Um, and when you start um, going back into time, you start thinking about moments and some of the things that Ron said to you and, and Steve, you know, I kind of said to you and. Yeah, you know, back then I used to be a bit of a, a bit of a smarty pants. No. Yeah, and I used to always tease Steve. It's part of the wingers union. Yeah, well, I used to always tease. I was just saying before to, to G2, I was saying, I used to always tease uh, Steve, I kind of saying to him, you had no skills and you're telling me how to play. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, I remember one training session, he chased me around the field. He wanted to, he wanted to tackle me. What, he you didn't know? catch you? No, he couldn't catch me. But uh, <laughs> but uh, it was it was interesting times. But I, I dare say that they would have planted a lot of, a lot of seeds they planted. Uh, we probably wouldn't have known back then. But mm. when you start going back at the time, start thinking about moments and discussions, uh, a lot of it starts making sense, absolutely. And I mean, look, Ron was um, so far ahead of everyone back Why? in the days. He was just, um, he was a football lover, but he just always educated himself. And um, he did a bit on a sense that I mean, people wouldn't know what he's doing. He was always uh, researching, he was always doing things back then. And you know, he's always come up with new ideas every, tra every training session. And he was just a good teacher. He was a very, very All good makes teacher. sense to that, that is a skill. That is a skill yeah. to, be, to be able to impart mm -hmm. right. information in such a fashion. Yes. That it doesn't bore you or you don't zone out. Mm. 
and you stay invested, exactly. yes, exactly. I think that's the key. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you find people who can do that, mm -hmm. it, whatever we're talking about, whether it be the media, whether it be the arts, whether it be um, you know uh, on the film set, whether it be in the football field, mm -hmm. you're, you're in a lucky place, you're in a magic place. R r you're right, George. I mean, look, Ron was one of those gentlemen that um, if you felt like you'd have a conversation with him, he would sit you down at all times and he would open his, his okay. house, his family house, just to come in and have a conversation, of how you're feeling, making sure you're okay. Just Stevie Connor wouldn't do it. But I mean, he, he loved, Stevie was different, different but uh, <laughs> he just loved, he just loved educating Ron. And when we had free time, Back then at the AOS, all we did was just go into the backfields and somehow we'll break into the lights and turn the lights on and just go play. And that's what we did. You know, we used to do that even on Sundays. We had no football and it was raining, it was cold in Canberra, and we'll just go play 6v6, bring the big goals in and just muck around. So that's why they finally closed the AIS, the light bill. The light bill you came back, <laughs> I opened up, oh my god. I'm sure out of all the things that happened at the AIS, <coughs> turning the, the lights on okay. wasn't the only thing that worked. No, it wasn't. Yeah. But okay, so who turned the lights on and got you to Preston Macedonia after AIS? Um, the, the Preston thing sort of fell in my lap. Um, Accidentally, because of just a conversation throughout the people. But I was just telling G2 before my coaching career pretty much started at Williamstown. Uh, I was going to coach, I think that was state two or state three back then, and I was going to get my hands dirty coaching that way. I thought I'd give that a crack in the lower league, start somewhere small, small club, and they were great people. And we assembled a good side and um, did you know six, seven weeks of pre-season. And the week before the season, I did a runner on them, and it was the hardest conversation I had to have with, with the club. It was it was very difficult because I uh, we did a lot of hard work for two months and prepared a good side, and we we're going to give a good you know good shake and promotion. And Preston came knocking the door, sitting I think last or second last in the VPL back then, and yeah. and I had to really think about it. I thought about it for a good two three days, and had a couple of conversations with my father. My father thought I was mad. He said to me, taking a job like that, it's a big responsibility. And I was there a big club. And How old were you at the time? I was 31, 32. Right. So was it similar as a player that fell into your lap like that? Is that what you're trying to say? Um, well, I mean, I don't know about it. Look, I, I, I think getting opportunities is obviously, no matter how old you are, you're going to obviously either sink or swim one or the other, Georgia. So um, as a player, you can sort of get yourself put in a position where you might need to play and you're probably not ready for it. So why Preston after the AIS? Um, well, I mean, look, I, I played at Preston. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, as a boy growing up, everyone wanted to play at Preston because they were obviously a Macedonian club and obviously a Macedonian heritage, and I supported the club at the same time. Um, you just thought it was an opportunity to play there. You would. Take it, yeah. Yeah, you'd take it. Um, and I did play there. Eventually, that was my first National League gig. But um, even as a coach, um, you know, I knew the club was in, in, a, in a tough position, but I thought it's an opportunity to coach the highest level. And I said to myself, either I sink or swim, and... Um, yeah, I swam, which was good. <laughs> and um, like I was saying earlier on to you, uh, I got instant success, which was, which was a little bit crazy. Um, you know, I did well in that first year, and I think we beat them. I think we just missed out in the finals, and then um, won the league the following year, minus three. This, you know, we're minus three points at the start of the season, and all this controversy happening, and um, we ended up winning the league. I, and I think we won it comfortably. And I turned around, and said to my wife back then, I said, "This is easy. <laughs> Coach, it's fun. This is easy." <laughs> And then it all went downhill after that. I just saw how really hard it was, and um, it, it's been a great challenge. You know, I think I've done 14 seasons now, coming into my 14th season as a coach, and I've learnt a lot, and I've probably learnt more in coaching than what I did as a player. I reckon. Yeah, that's a given. Uh, we're talking to Goran Lozanovsky, who's our uh, pioneer on FNR. The pioneers on a Thursday night uh, reaches out, and uh, G1 and G2. We've been trying to identify people who've been difference makers, people who've added uh, their experience and their energy to the game and made it better. Uh, and we've had some terrific characters uh, of all uh, colours and all persuasions, and not all wingers. Um, <laughs> but using some of the logic you used a little while ago, you said you you wanted to play for Preston and you're Macedonian. Mm. Uh, well, using that logic, how did you end up in South Melbourne? <laughs> <laughs> I had no choice, George. Preston got relegated. I love but, it. Uh... <laughs> I love it. Tell us about it. You know, look, um, obviously as a player, um, I was at Preston, and then I think it was the, the first season I was at Preston, I think the following year, I think Heidelberg got relegated, and then Preston got relegated, I think. I don't know, it could have been the same year, I'm not too sure. But, you know, Close. I think it was a year apart from memory. But... Um, I ended up at Adelaide City before I went to Yes, that's Melbourne. right. And yeah, that was a great so, experience for you. Yeah, it was great. It? So 
the Adelaide City thing happened after the Preston scenario. So Zoran purchased me from Adelaide City. And he obviously Zoran had his scouts out here. But at South Melbourne, I ended up there because... What a good coach yeah, he has been. Yeah. Yeah. But South Melbourne happened because the Colin Warriors falling apart. Uh-huh. And, um, and Ange came in and just poached everyone you could at Colin Warriors. And, um, so that we, Colin with Warriors, you haven't had many people on the show who lived through that yep. close in. So we're, mm-hmm. we're probably one of the first. So 12 months-ish... Mm. So it went from a very big high, big introduction, huge crowd at Victoria Park that yeah. opening day. Wait, did Eddie like, front every week? Eddie who? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Eddie, the president Eddie of the Collingwood Football Club? You would no. never have seen Eddie, would Eddie you? wasn't there. No, he wasn't. <laughs> but tell us, talk us through the highs and the lows and yeah. through that. I mean, I, I was at Adelaide at that moment. Um, I think we just got back from the uh, Olympics, 1996 Atlanta Olympics. And, um, sorry, part, of the Ollie Roos, yeah, part of the Ollie Ruse. Yeah, part of the Ollie Ruse. And I was contemplating about staying in Adelaide or coming back to Melbourne. And um, Zoran obviously wasn't coaching and then he got the job at Colin Warriors. And gave me a call and said to me, what do you reckon, buddy, you gonna come back to Melbourne? And I said to him, what do you mean to do what? <laughs> he goes to me, come and join the new club. And I just went, who? What? And he goes to me, Collingwood. And I'm a big Collingwood supporter, right? Okay. I said, Collingwood, I go, what do you mean Collingwood? And he goes to me, I didn't know they were Macedonian. <laughs> they were once Peter Dacos. <laughs> Peter Dacos was there. <laughs> of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True. The Ma- Macedonia Marvel. That's and right. um, yeah, so Zoran obviously took the job, and I just said to him, all right, I said, we'll give it a crack, get him back to Melbourne, and um, I'm pretty sure if Zoran's involved, it's going to be decent. So that was my uh, thoughts about Colin Warriors. And when I got back here, I sort of found out a bit more information about them. In, obviously, Hodderberg being involved with the club, and it's a mutual agreement. and. So you know what, I said, all right, we'll give it a crack, and Zoran's bloody built his team, and I think we built a decent squad. It's a great um, squad. Yeah, paper. we probably didn't have enough depth. I think, you don't play yet. on paper, G2. <laughs> <laughs> Just one of those things I picked up on the coaching. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, true, on. true. But um, yeah, look, it, it, was, uh, it was a crazy ride. I, I think it was probably a year too early. They probably needed a bit, a bit more preparation. They jumped the gun and got in there pretty early. And um, look, it's all started off well. Obviously, 15,000 the first day. Cool. It could have been more. I think people are knocked back and yeah. had, a, had a great win against Melbourne Knights, um, 3 0. And had a good couple of weeks, I think it was. And then I remember I got injured, I think it was round two or round three. I think I fractured my heel with Mark Coney. So it's your fault. And then a couple other injuries happened. And like I said earlier on, there was no depth in that mm-hmm. squad. Um, and then we started obviously struggling for some sort of results. And then there was some obviously external issues with the club. and. Some agreements didn't, didn't work out the way they should have worked out, and then, and then before you know it, the club's uh, in dire straits. So um, it was it was a good start to it all, but then it just went all pear shaped, and unfortunately, what a great shame. Yeah, what it was, it shame. was. But from that obviously scenario, I mean, it was good. You know, we were training at Vic Park, and we had a good field, and it was old in there. The, the stadium was really old, but um, what was the actual pitch? like to play on? The pitch was good. The pitch was very good, actually. Um, it was better than what we thought it was going to be. It didn't feel like a football stadium. I was trying to lock it in and have sort of everyone sitting in like a, a half circle. It was a little bit awkward. Yeah. They experimented mm-hmm. so many times through the NSL mm-hmm. and whatever, but it just didn't... Western Oval was tried. And well, was Western Oval was tried. I, I think, really obviously, you Carlton... couldn't get the, the grandstands to move in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. That only happens at Marble. It's only, Marble. It's only, it's only at Marble. Yeah. But um, I think Carlton obviously tried it as well. Yeah. But look, it, it, it was good while it lasted, but uh, it was always going to be difficult, I think. Yeah. You know, working with a football club and trying to have two different codes working together was always challenging. All right, take us back, South Melbourne. Come on. Yeah, so then Big An- move for the, uh, Ange, for the Ange, after, after that uh, scenario happened. What did Ange say? Ange came knocking and he called me up for a, for a meeting and we had a conversation and I said to him, I go, look, as far as I'm concerned, at, right at this moment, South Melbourne's you know, top two clubs in the, in the country and you know, I think um, the club's in a great position to progress and maybe win some titles coming up. And I said to him, I go, my, my biggest issue is obviously, you know, sometimes you know, I always argue his point about politics and it does my head in. Um, but uh, in the end, I was a footballer and it was my job. And, um, and I said to Angel, I said, I'm coming here to work. I'm not coming here to play politics. To play politics. Really? And um, that was my conversation with Angel. And Angel was adamant that that was never going to be the issue at the club. Not with him. And um, while he was there, he was true to his word and it wasn't. Fantastic. And, um, you know, how, did the fa- how did the fans, uh, and they are vociferous, what, mm-hmm. what were they like? That was my, my biggest fear, George. Uh, my, my biggest fear that I was going to get criticised for my heritage more than anything else. And I was scared about that at one stage. But unfortunately, oh, no, not fortunately, it actually worked out well. Um, I think they respected and appreciated my efforts. 
and because I did what I had to do. They embraced but, you. Uh, yeah. From what I yeah. remember. No, they no. And look, and I haven't got a, a bad thing to say about anyone in South Melbourne. I think uh, my journey there for four years was was amazing. Um, we won two titles. Went to Brazil. Hey, hang on, uh, hang on, hang on. Don't just, don't just water it, wash it down. Thank well, well, great times. Yeah, uh, look, I'm, I'm not World Club Championship. It was unbelievable. It really? was unbelievable. We haven't, it was had, unbelievable. Any, we haven't had anyone who's been there either. So, yeah, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. No, nah, look, it, it, was, it was amazing. I mean, Ange. <laughs> Tell me about Blatzis. Big con. What a legend. Eh? He was a beast. Great boy. He was a beast. Yeah, gentleman, absolute gentleman. He, we, was, we, he was in my original squad when I took over at South Melbourne as president. He was fantastic. He was still playing there. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. body, the, the body, body was couldn't holding in. quite, couldn't quite <laughs> give us what what we needed. But by golly, he he tried really, really hard. And my heart went out to him, and yeah. uh, I respect him this very day. Yeah, uh, just a fabulous guy. But you, no. had, you saw him. Look, Con was obviously um, the, you know, a little bit younger than us. Uh, he was part of the Bill Damianos and some of the younger yep. boys, Tanzel Beza. Yeah. They were all coming through the, the youth system at that stage. So Ange um, saw some good things in him and elevated them. And they were still part of the, the next generation of Holy Roos. So I think our squad was, was, was assembled amazingly well. I mean, Ange, I think, signed um, myself, uh, Con Butianos and Johnny H. In that, in that time, his first year as, as head coach. And um, once he added, I suppose, ourselves and a few other players into that squad, we already felt that we were a super squad. We felt like we were gonna, we were gonna do well and we were confident. Tell me about Butzianis. I, I, mm. I see Con today as a, a, a finisher. <coughs> he, he's the sort of guy who uh, is, a, is a specialist coach. Yep. Yeah? Yep. Uh, why? Because he is meticulous in his preparation. Was he always so? He was, he was. Um, we, in in Angers era, we and started bringing in full-time training, so there was probably <coughs> about six, seven of us that didn't work. And um, Andrew was happy to come in and do some extra training session during the morning morning session. So we started that. You know, it was about six, seven of us, and we said, "Yeah, we'll have to come in, uh, do a double session." We're keen. We'll keen Sports out. science. And, well, and Andrew, Andrew was loving it, and because Andrew was doing it full time as well, he was enjoying it. So we're having some great sessions, and um, that's when I really got to know Con. I mean, yeah, you watch Con a lot on, on TV. And obviously, I never played with with the bloke, and um, you know. Pretty much met him, and he just loved the game, and his, his technique was was amazing. And we used to argue um, about free kicks, and I used to always say to, I used to always say to him, I go, your technique, like his technique is, is is flawless. Correct. His technique is flawless, and people don't give him enough credit. They don't give him enough credit. No. And um, we we you know, we we hit free kicks for fun. I reckon one stage my crew was going to fall off. We hit that many free kicks, and I used to always tease him back then because I said, you don't use your right foot enough, right? <laughs> And then he started practicing on his right foot, so his right foot's pretty good now. But uh, back then we used, to, we used to tease each other. But um, my technique was so different to, to Con's, and we used to sit and look at each other and just go, "Wow," which is so different. But we could do similar things. Yeah, his was a bit more conventional yep. in terms of the run up and the leading mm -hmm. technically. Yours was a bit more side on, which is the way you used to hit a lot of those fast whipping crosses. Yep. Yours was definitely unique. Top spin or, or side well, spin. No, but you, you used to hit it pretty much side on. Do you know what I mean? At, I that, did. at that right angle, which. Mm -hmm gave it so much pace and for strikers sure, coming yeah. into the box attacking the ball they yeah. would have been loving that knowing that that's how you're going to drop it in was that just a natural thing or was that something you deliberately went to be different like or was it just the way you played and hit the ball and struck it i i actually um like i said earlier on i wasn't a winger um when zoran manager converted me to a winger i said well how, how can i be different uh, i used to always ask myself how can i be different to any other wide player so obviously I was a Man United fan. I loved David Beckham. Yeah. And I used to watch him cross, and I said to myself, "Well, I need to practice crossing, and not just crossing a ball static, just crossing a ball on the run." Yeah. So that's what I did. Full gate. So that's how much? How much time at your peak of training you, would you have spent doing that practice? I'll tell you what. I reckon it took me a good two years to perfect it. Yeah. Yeah, but that was me doing sessions on the my extras. own while guys were working. I was doing stuff on my own, yeah. and that just me being me because I just love the game and. I was fortunate enough not to be working, so... We've, we've, we've skipped over Adelaide. We need to go mm. back. Yep. Alex Tobin, uh, yep. Joey Mullen. Uh, mm. There would have been some fantastic guys there. In fact, uh, hold on to it. We'll mm. take a break. Uh, you're listening to the Pioneers. G1 and G2 with our pioneer this week, Goran Lusnowski. <laughs> Welcome back to the Pioneers. Thursday night, you're with G1 and G2 with our special guest, Goran Lusnowski. 
um, who features in our promo. You realise that, don't you? I, I, I did hear that, yeah. That's good. I'm to make sure. <laughs> We've had a few, only a couple of guests who feature in that. that I mean, I'm still working I on think, some I think I was G1, I was wearing my coloured boots that game. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you. What what was grand, they? What grand they final? They, they were gold that day. Gold. gold. Well, yeah. uh, so who got you into the gold boots? Well, it wasn't just, David Clarkson. So when I went to South Melbourne, um, they were sponsored by Puma. And oh, they were trying to force me to wear Puma boots. I said, no, because I'm sponsored by Lotto. Oh. And um, Mr. Forbes said to me, well, I'll sponsor you. So I said, all right, cool. So I went to Puma, we had a chat, and he goes to me, but if I sponsor you, you gotta be doing me a favor. I said, what's that? And he goes to me, oh, you gotta wear these colored boots because the AFL players don't want to touch them. And I said, cool. I said, So you led the way well, in some respects. Well, I mean, Warwick Kepper was, Warwick Kepper was wearing them, but I don't know, he just couldn't get them any high. But in the, end, in the end, I started wearing them. I said, well, if I get them for free, I'll wear them, no dramas. <laughs> copped, copped a lot of flack for them. You would have. I did, but uh, in the end, I suppose it became, uh, Part of me. If you've got flash boots and you can back it up on the field, people will shut up. <laughs> and you that is the only, up. But you that's the only disclaimer. You've got to be able to back yeah, it up. Yeah, you've got to be able to back it up. Um, I mean, the one question I have that we, on the boots thing, yep. I don't think boots today protect the players like the old boots used to. They feel wonderful, they look magnificent on, you can twist and turn, you can almost step out of your boot. Look, well, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm thinking that can't possibly be. Look, I don't think the boots that we were wearing were, were protecting us any better than what these days are. Okay. They're, probably, they're probably a lot heavier, but they actually were a lot more comfortable in our boots back in our days. I think these boots aren't as comfortable. Right. That's what they are. They just look good. They're obviously a lot lighter. So fashion, it wins again. It's fashion, apparently. But, oh. um, yeah, I, look, I think the quality of the boots are, have gone down. If you can wear them on a dance floor, well, they're probably <laughs> not good enough for a soccer pitch, right? G2, G2 like what colour boots did you wear? Black, always. Got you there. there you go. Oh, now, I'm, I'm swearing, I'm thinking they're the uh, high resolution green ones. No chance, <laughs> not a chance in hell. Now, South Melbourne, yep. and while you're living around the corner from me, mm -hmm. sunshine, yep. you packed up and took a risk and decided to go to Germany. How did that come about in the first place? And then talk us through that journey. Yeah, well, I suppose it's every player's dream to, to play in Europe one day. Um, you know, in the nineties, it was a little bit difficult trying to get yourself overseas. Uh, there was a few agents flying around, but um, just opening up a door. And they always wanted the uh, international football to come abroad. So if you were playing for your country, then you, know, you were very limited for opportunities in, in Europe. So I was fortunate enough to get a few caps, um, and obviously being part of the Oliver and Socceroos, so a few doors opened up. Um, prior to me going to, to Alemannia Aachen, I ended up at um, Alemannia Billerfield. The year before that, I went for a trial, and um, I was meant to go to that. They were happy to sign. They wanted to sign me on a six-month loan deal, then with a further investment. Did you have a European passport? Um, I didn't. To one? I didn't. I had access to one <coughs> at that stage, but um, that was an issue. Uh -huh. I was at South Melbourne, still contracted, and South wouldn't didn't want to let me go for a six-month loan at that moment because we were going for our back-to-back -back title, and uh, I was very disappointed at that stage. But um, the opportunity would have been for South Melbourne to make some good money. Sure. Anyway. And um, so we did with Mike Petr uh, Michael Petkovic. Yeah, and Petkovic. We, 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 we managed to get uh, yeah. a really good return for a terrific young guy. Who yeah, did it a was. Good job for us. It was. I mean, look, it, was, it would have been a great investment for for the club because I think if they let me go in that six months, that the deal was if we get promoted, you're going to get X amount of dollars afterwards. But it never eventuated. So in the end, following year, I ended up leaving pretty much for free. Went to went to Alemania and obviously had a few trials there. And um, was a young coach. Uh, I think it was second year into coaching, um, and he was happy with what he saw, and he really wanted the winger to create, and that's what he was searching for. But it was always difficult. I mean, when, when you bring in a foreigner, he needs to be exceptional, he needs to be better than what he got in his, in his team, and if you're not, then you're not going to get a contract, obviously. So Did you get grief from the fellow professionals? We did. Um, look, in my time, I was fortunate enough, there was an Aussie already there, which was Mark Rudin, who's currently coaching Wellington. He was already at that club for six months, so it made my transition a bit easier, having an Aussie there. Um, if you don't, uh, you'd have a, have a friend there, I suppose it would be harder. Um, sure. But I think you've got to earn your stripes. Uh, I think uh, I, learned that, I learned that six months into my project when I was there thinking, you know what, if I knew, if I did what I did now, then what I did, you know, I left that, that six months rides, I probably would have been a little bit more comfortable about it. But I was being too, too nice. I was being respectful. Um, I was just trying to learn the ropes in my first time in Europe. And the thing is, I went there at 27. People don't realise, I didn't go to 22, 20, I went to 27. So I was a lot older 
even though it was experience, I'll still be respectful, but then I'll learn, you know what, if I don't be nasty and ruthless, I'm not gonna survive in this country or anywhere in Europe. So it was this babble is saying the same thing to his players at the moment mm. of the Western Sydney Wanderers. Yeah. Uh, he wants them to be a little more nasty. Yeah, yeah, I, I, look, I agree with him. I agree with him. I mean, look, in Germany, uh, the team that I was at, it wasn't a, a large club. Um, it, they weren't a great football club, either, I suppose, on the park. They were a team that was struggling at one stage. Um, and obviously, uh, they got X amount of foreigners, and I was brought there to make a difference. Um, and I, I, look, I, I think I did okay. I played about 10 or 11 games, and then by mid season, things went pear shaped at the club. Uh, there was a bit of corruption going on there. Presidents, vice presidents coach involved as well and before you know it the club was upside down everyone was booted out uh, new management came in new coach came in and didn't fancy me and um, before you know it things just went went south and um, I was sitting there just training and not playing weekends and trying to find another club um, and then that stage I was married um, my wife was pregnant and I said you know just easy come home and that's what I did and to this day people sit there and say to me uh, do, do you regret it I said to them sometimes you do but then, you know, I think if you're single, you take that risk and you hang sure. about. You know? But I think when you've got a young family at the start, it's a little bit difficult. And you came back and you went to what, Adelaide? I went back to Adelaide, yeah. yeah. But going back to Germany, um, it was a great experience. Um, just to see the level of intensity and, and how ruthless they are as Germans. And they're just so mentally strong, the Germans. I mean, they, they could, their ability wasn't the greatest. Like their technical mm. abilities were not the greatest back when I was there in 2001. But their stamina, they're, they're just tenacious and they never give up attitudes, unbelievable. And it was very, very similar to the Aussie mentality. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, which, is, which is probably why, what uh, Mark Rudin is now using mm. at uh, Wellington. Yeah, some I mean, look, I mean, Mark, he learned then. Yeah, he did. He some did. of the things you learned uh, playing the caper as a player. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, like I said, from, from some of the stuff we experienced in Germany, it, it, it was amazing. Um, but in saying that, it would have been great just to spend a bit more time there, you know what I mean? But it just didn't work out for me. But it was a great experience. Uh, but you know, kids these days think it's easy just to get there, get, get yourself well, overseas. Well, I love hearing from fans who keep telling me that how how can you have a coach who plays only his favourites? Uh, go to Europe and watch how they play only their favourites. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you know, living proof. Yeah, look, it is. I mean, look, it does get a little bit uh, obvious uh, in, in Europe when, when players <laughs> get uh, you know chosen week in week out. So what sort of crowds would you play up, uh, for Alemania? Well Alemania was good, it was a small town but obviously rich history on the border of um, Germany and Holland, um, they had 20,000 20,000 supporters, good, yeah. yeah so you know, it's the, it's, it, it, it was good, it was good atmosphere, obviously now, now they've got a brand new stadium there so and they ended up playing Bundesliga football I think for two or three seasons after I left and then got demoted now I think they're probably in like third or fourth tier football at the moment so they've gone really low but um, look great little town, great experience, um, you know some beautiful people there uh, unfortunate for me, I've been staying here longer in Europe, but um, yeah, for me, I just think you know, experiencing that and, and seeing what the level of intensity was and the type of footballs that were there and playing the oppositions, like some of the cup games we played against Bayer Leverkusen, they were super side back then. Um, we got torn to shreds. We got torn to shreds and they were unreal and it just really showed um, showed me how far away I was as a footballer. Gee. Speaking of European uh, <clears throat> Vacations. Mm. You went to the Olympics in '92, Barcelona, wasn't it? '96. '96. I yeah. was at Atlanta then. Yeah, it was Atlanta. Oh, I got that yeah. wrong. Okay. <laughs> Talk us through that experience. Yeah, that experience was amazing. Um, I remember the qualifiers. We had to play Canada in the two legger. So went to Canada and played them there. And from memory, I think it was three one or three nil. And then I think we belted them at Sydney Football Stadium. I think it was five nil at home. But um, yeah, got got to the Olympics, qualified. Um, mm. Unbelievable experience. Uh, we're based in Miami. That's our group play. We played in Miami, but we're based there for a month pre-camp and wow. spent a whole month in, in Miami. <laughs> so that was an amazing experience. We're working Monday to Friday, and weekends are off. And good old Mr. Eddie Thompson was uh, was coaching us back then, and we were there shine flag and that. And um, you know, they had the weekends off, but uh, it was an amazing experience. And just to play in those tournaments, um, you know, we played Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, we played France first game, and then. We had to win our last game against uh, uh, Spain and uh, we we're 2 0 up in the first half. 2 0 up. 2 0 up against in the first Spain. Mm. And they had some what happened? Stars. You got run over. Well, I mean, I was on the bench that game and uh, <laughs> I was sitting there watching the game going, wow, we're going to Nice handball. We're, we're going to beat Spain. <laughs> and um, like I was saying earlier on. Who did they have in their team? Oh, so um, Casillas was in goals. Uh, Raul was up front. He's Maureen. still learning the caper, by the way, Casillas. Yeah, yeah, he's still learning. Um, mm. Morient, I think it was Morientes was there as well, um, and they had, a, they had a gentleman called um, 
Delatenia, who was, was the Buddha. And back in those days, he was a superstar for Barcelona. But you know, for some reason, some of the young generation don't remember the, remember him at all. But uh, he, he was an amazing footballer. And, um, before Messi. Yeah, before, before Messi. Way, exactly. <laughs> and uh, look, he came on that game and uh, just turned the game around for him. And um, he was an amazing footballer. And I was just saying earlier on to George, I was saying, uh, Eddie Thomas said to me, look, you know, Lozzi, you're going to come on. And you're just going to go there and just try and close. That's not what you said. That's not what you said. That's not what you said. What did I say? <laughs> What's something that kicked the shit out of yeah. him? No, he did say to me, he goes, go in there and hurt him. And I said, how do you want to hurt him? He goes to me, just uh, knock him about a few times. He goes, make sure he doesn't go to the ball. So I did that once, got booked. And uh, the second time I couldn't do it. And he put the ball through my legs and crossed the ball. And somehow the ball ricocheted and went in and got him on level terms. And um, then we had to go chase the game and try and score a winner. We had a couple of chances. Uh, I think Peter Tkans missed a diving header, which we what? put his back in the lead. In the oh. lead. Yeah, Pete missed a diving header and um, they went balls. back the other way and scored. And, and they been better three two. But um, it, it was an amazing experience. But it was gut-wrenching. Gut-wrenching. Give us the squad. Oh, back then, geez. Um, players like Ante Moric, yep. left back. Yeah, goalkeeper. Uh, Castley, um, Frank Juric in goals. Uh, Muskie centre back. Uh, who were over, overage players? Steve Horvath. I can't remember if Steve Horvath was there. Um, Aurelia Vidmo was there. Yeah. Obviously, Paduka was up front. Joe Spiteri was in that squad. Spiteri was in the tell, squad tell as us well. Tell about the V bomber. The V bomber was amazing. Just um, obviously playing against him a few times. Um, you know, Adelaide City, Melbourne Night games and derbies. Mm. He was just an extraordinary talent. Yeah, he was just so far ahead for his uh, for his age. And you know. no ego in that regard, is it? No, nah, nothing. Just at all. a fabulous character. I haven't seen him up that close as an opponent, and then mm. having played with him. Yep. I rate him as our best product ever, but that's just yep. an opinion, right? Yeah, absolutely. But you've seen him a lot closer than most. Yep. Where do you rate him in our, in our greatest players? And having said that, you played with a young Some guy called ways. Trimboli who wasn't too yeah. bad. Well, I mean, look, you know, Trim is there. Yeah. He's unbelievable. I mean, yeah, going back to Adelaide City, there was some amazing. I think there was six, seven soccer rooks in Adelaide Jeff City. Marlon, yeah, Alan, Alan, Tobin, Tobin, Robert Zamitza. Robert was a big in goals, amazing. I mean, look for me, Milan Ivanovic was just unbelievable. Oh, just yeah. being playing with him and just watching him make a lot. He just made football look so easy. It was unbelievable. His and people, brain worked a million miles. People tend to forget. You know, he played for Redstone. He played against AC Milan. He was marking Frank Rijko at one yeah. stage. So this guy's you know, he's been around. Yeah, but, um, yeah, but the V bomber was. You know, <laughs> I can't remember. I think I was, I was telling my kids, and they were asking me how many trophies I'd won like, as, as, a, as a young footballer coming yeah. up. And I said to them, I, go, I got nominated as an under 21 player of the year, of the National League. And they go, Oh, yeah. I go, but I didn't win it. And they go, Who won it? I said, uh, Mark Paduka. <laughs> and they go, Oh, yeah. They go, Who's that? I said, Well, he ended up playing for Celtic and Leeds and they go, They go, Geez, Dad, he's had some career. He goes, What did my kids go to me? What happened to you? I said, Well, <laughs> obviously, uh, I the had a career. But, the <laughs> yeah, it was the backhand. But, yeah. um, well, listen, system. if those if your children are listening, um, mm. what are their names? Uh, Jeanne and Sienna. Okay. Now, Sienna, listen carefully because <laughs> Dad's going. We're going to do a little word association with Dad. Um, we're going to give you a name. Tell us what you remember. Uh, Warren Spink. Oh Jesus Christ! He was uh, he was extraordinary in Preston days. He was unbelievable. He was a legend in the club, that's for sure. But um, played with him in the national team too. Great finisher. Great finisher. I think he could have got more out of himself, but um, yeah, he was good. Why didn't he? I don't know. Probably his own own reasons. He's probably got his own reasons. I'm not too sure. But um, was he not, de- not saying from the dedication and commitment? Yeah, I think the culture was different back then. George. Yeah. I think the culture of, our, of of those players were, was different, um, and probably the opportunities of what they had. John Markowski. Well, um, he was my idol. John, John was my idol. Um, watching him grow when up. When he played against us, I hated him. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you, you had to rate him. He was yeah, so special. Yeah, you know, we talk about obviously who we thought you know could have been the ultimate Australian footballer. Um, no, we all agree he should have been. I think I think John should have been one of our best. Correct. Yeah, no, but no, um, obviously no, he, he didn't fulfil that. But um, he, he was extraordinary. Just watching him as a young supporter of the game and watching him play for George Cross in the early days and at Preston at Justin, it was, it was it was unbelievable. He was so far ahead of everyone else, but. Um, he was one that I think every child or every young footballer aspired to be like him. Yeah. Mickey, Mickey P. Amazing. I, I, I watched Mickey P. I didn't know Mickey P. that well, the crabber. Um, I got to know I got to know him a lot more when I was at South Melbourne. But um, extraordinary individual. Um, great knowledge of, of the game. He obviously coached at South Melbourne for a while. Um, but um, what a footballer. He, he wasn't uh, he wasn't a goal scoring machine, but um, keeping position and, and finding targets. He, he was amazing, and he could still do it. My first first year at South Melbourne, he was broken, but uh, he would train here and there. 
and um, he could still knock a ball and hit you on the nose. He was unbelievable. Unbelievable. What a footballer. Uh, while you were at Adelaide City, you said mm. a lot of the international Ivanovic stand out. Yeah. Uh, the local boys, uh, those Socceroos, did you play with Malta? Uh, Serge, yeah. yeah. We're talking about fullbacks. So Serge was my backup back in those days. Like? Yeah, he was unbelievable. Charlie Villani, Serge Melton. Yeah. Well, Charlie was uh, done by the time I got there. But Serge was still going. Uh, yeah, he played 500, he, what is it, 600 games? It was, it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. He, he was uh, he was like, I think we were like 15 years apart. And he was still running past me during yeah. the game. I, I called the goal of the year. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Uh, when, when I called Preston Macedonia against Adelaide yep. at Hindmarsh. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and it was Charlie Villani and Sergio Milta. Wow. Well, Imagine. Wow. Well, and he was still playing. He was still playing with me. Yeah, yeah, he was still playing with me. He, he was an absolute character. He was an absolute beast. But, um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, Sergio Milta, yeah, Schillerbeer was there, Tony Vidmar. Oh. Um, really, I was already overseas. Um, who's, who's who of Australian football effectively that Adelaide City, wasn't it? It was, it was. I mean, that, they, were the, the, they were the talk of the country at one stage. And um, to get an opportunity to go there as a 19 year old footballer and uh, his experience that I was happy just to be a part of that training team and not play um, and in, <laughs> just the end, watch. in the end I ended up playing every game would you believe it yeah, yeah, it, it right, was right, unbelievable right. but um, it was a great opportunity so um, I could have been more thankful we were fans we watched it was great Fantastic. speaking so, of opportunities mm. with South Melbourne you had a wonderful experience the, yeah, world, to the meet world, world Club Championships yeah to meet David Beckham would you believe our wives did? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would believe that. <laughs> so we Despite seen, every one of you um, in the last five minutes all trying to get near him to swap his shirt at the end of the game. Well, was, Steve Panopoulos did that. It's, uh, he was actually, I think he handcuffed himself to it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Panopoulos is still in Brazil, I think, isn't he? Yeah, no, he is. He's obviously uh, married to a Brazilian he's woman and living there. Someone else there he's now he's handcuffed uh, to someone else. But yeah. um, he did get his top that day. But uh, look, what an experience. I mean, just to qualify for that tournament. For me, it was a bit like, is this seriously going to happen? You know, we're going to call off this tournament, we're going to go to Brazil. Um, I remember playing in a game. Um, what, what did get a game? We were in Fiji. No, before uh, we had to qualify. Before it, it, it was crazy. We were playing the local Fiji team, and um, the crowd was crazy. I think it was 5,000 people. It was, it was nuts. And the grass was thick. It was Super passionate. There, there was toads flying, jumping yeah. around the ground. It was crazy. <laughs> it was madness. And, and just the game had to get pitch. through... Yeah, yeah, it was a game that we needed to win to get through, um, and it was the toughest game I think we had to play ever in, in our time in South Melbourne. It, the conditions were, t were atrocious, and um, from memory, I think Fausto hit a bomb from like 30 metres and, and scored a goal, and we won the game. And it was such, it was just such a relief just to get through that game because we knew what the, the end you know, product was, and it was an opportunity to go to Brazil and play against some amazing footballers. And, Fortunate enough for me, uh, we played Man United on my birthday, so um, it was a great, great day for me and. Um, even though Quinton Fortune uh, destroyed really? me that day and scored double, uh, right. I couldn't keep up with him. But um, what were, you, were you playing as a wing back at that? Was that? I was. Yeah. 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 That was you know, the dark was days. The dark days of, of a wing back, um, which I absolutely dreaded um, back in my days. But um, being a winger, George, you understand how how nice it is to have, to play to play uh, a rather, full back. Rather and, sit on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it, I suppose the game was changing and the formations were changing. And, being a, a wing back was obviously challenging. You had that good engine and get up and down. And if you defend it better, I suppose your attacking side of things when it's good. And if you attacked well, um, you, suppose, uh, you expose your defence. So um, it was a challenging position, but um, it was a time of the transformation. And we played as a wing back. It was challenging, but um, you know what? Just experiencing that against uh, Man United it was an amazing experience. Did you get a shirt off anyone? I did. I got my idol, uh, Ryan Gig. Oh, did you? Ryan Gig. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah. Got his got his strip. He didn't play that day. Um, he did a football conditioning session after the game, but um, I hung around and made sure I got his shirt. Fantastic. Um, and look, I mean, the guys were excellent. Uh, we walked in the change room and, and changed, you know, exchanged strips, and um, they were all pretty good about it. And a couple of crazy moments in there. There was some uh, sarcasm from some of the Man United players, and Roy Keane tipped where Roy Keane came in and put him, put him in their place, and, and said, "Be respectful." And, yeah. And just so, said, who, who, were, who were the ones who were a bit lippy? Who was sarcastic? So, so, um, would you believe it? The current Man United coach. Yeah, I believe it. Uh, yeah. Oli Gunnar. Oli Gunnar, but he was sort of getting peppered by um, Andy Cole. They were sort of sitting yeah. there giggling. Uh, yeah. Egging him on? Egging him on, but giggling at us, saying, look at these amateurs. And um, yeah, it felt like we would just come off the street. And so they had a bit of a laugh with us. But um, I was a little bit disappointed at seeing that. Mm. So I really didn't care. I just wanted to get Ryan Giggs' stop. I was just ecstatic to get his stop. <laughs> and then 
Roy Keane came in and put him in, put put him in their place. Him. And, um, That's great. I sat there, I just, just had utmost respect for Roy Keane because um, he hardly played that tournament, but he was an absolute gentleman and spoke to everyone and conducted himself in the right way. And, um, That's got a gamma. What a side. Uh, uh, but to tell you what, they had two legends playing up front. The Animal or Mario. Unbelievable. And they were old and they were still quick. Anyone who's played against the Mario, brain. their eyes light up. Look. Yeah, it, it, it's amazing. Like, you, you just you don't understand how quick he's off the mark when you, until you see it live. Yeah, like he just reads things. He, he moves into space and you go, where's he going? And before you know it, the ball's there. So it, it was amazing watching him live. And that, that was a problem. I, I said you were to, watching? I said to people, I was watching instead of playing because <laughs> I was admiring and the, the atmosphere was crazy because, you know, everyone... Tell us about the crowds. It was well, that first game, I actually think that they didn't charge anyone because they had a full house. I said, there's no way they've charged people to come in today because I think that's why they get a full house. And it was unbelievable. I, I was actually, I was in, I was actually tearing up in the, at the start in the anthems and just saying, I can't believe I'm sitting here in the muddy canal with Vasco de Gama team and just a full house. Yeah. Nick Maclusis, who's the current uh, president or about yep. to be, yep. uh, still treasures it as one of the greatest moments in the, of his life mm -hmm. to be in the crowd to watch. And he, he's right. And my wife, who obviously not a football lover, she loves the game, but yeah. not as much. Was, was, she was still there. talks about it to this day. Yeah. Um, we had, and, we had, and Beckham. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he had Beckham as well. She's got the photo with him. <laughs> like after that game, our wives were in the bus and they said, Hang on, guys, we can't leave right now because David Beckham's calling us from the bus, and they actually uh, went on the bus. So it was about, I think, four or five girls on the bus just to say good out to him. But he, um, he has an amazing power over men and women. Doesn't uh, he's unbelievable, yeah, <laughs> even men, you're right. Um, but uh, look, it, it, was, it was an unbelievable experience. I mean, and, and it just showed um, we, we were a good team, South Melbourne, and it just showed how far away we were from being professionals. Mate, uh, being professionals, you haven't been far away. Uh, as a coach, uh, you won promotion with your boyhood club, Altona Magic, in 2017. Mm. 2018, you won promotion in the NPL 2 West, which means that after an absence of eight years, you've managed to get the club back to the top flight of the NPL in Victoria, which is a huge, huge pat on the back. Mm. You should be yeah, very thanks, proud. Thanks, mate. <laughs> no, no? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean... Oh. Is, is Dad still with us? No, no, Dad passed on no, a no, couple no, of years ago now, but um, he was around when, when I took the job. Right. Yeah, he was around, so he knew about it, and um, he couldn't be more happy. So but, his uh, words resonate, huh? Yeah, no, absolutely. You, yeah, absolutely. You'll, you'll, you'll do okay. I always, said to, I always said to Dad, one day I'll end up back there coaching him, but uh, I said, I don't know when. And um, fortunate, enough, fortunate enough for myself, uh, the gentleman that got me back there, he's, uh, he's our current president, Igor Georgievsky, and um, I couldn't be more grateful for him for, for giving me the opportunity to get, back, get myself back to the club and, um, and I suppose get some success, which is everyone's dream, but it uh, doesn't always get the plan, but we've, we've had you know, a couple of amazing years at the moment and um, we've done a lot of hard work at the club and um, I couldn't be more proud of the people that work at our club and uh, I think we do a lot of hard work and I think we've just got all the rewards that we've, uh, that we've shown them all the hard work. So um, no, it's, been, it's been astonishing and um, you know, I'll turn the magic of won five titles in, in the old VPL and um, you know, they, they are a powerhouse and they've got a, got a rich history of 50 years we did last year and um, you know, obviously it's great to get it back there again after eight years. Happy anniversary. Yeah, thanks and um, we're, we're really looking forward to the NPL coming up this year and um, you know, everyone at the club's excited and um, the good thing about it is we're, we're actually bringing back some, some old supporters and old players. Tell the them they can come and get a club show on FNR. <laughs> some of the, the other clubs have done, the Knights are coming, the, uh, the Preston's here. South Melbourne have led the way, so it's I'll fantastic. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, George, if I ended up uh, coming back on the show and just keep doing radio, I might just forget about coaching. You reckon? <laughs> You've got the voice for it. You, got the you reckon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, it's, uh, no, it's been good. It's, it's been a great journey and uh, it's, uh, it's awesome and um, you know, we couldn't be happier I'll find the magic at the moment. Well, we couldn't be happier, mate. G1 and G2, we're thrilled to bits. Uh, we've been looking forward to this uh, since the turn of the year. 2019 means a lot to us because it means that what George's idea was at the very beginning was to... Uh, to make a bit of a history and create a bit of a, uh, a museum, uh, an yep. oral museum for the for the people who don't remember or have, mm. uh, you know weren't fortunate enough to be around, but also for an opportunity for us to tell help tell the story yep. and bind this game even closer than it has been because it deserves it. There have been some fabulous men, mm. some fabulous women, some great referees. We had Dennis. Uh, you saw that. Last yeah, week. Saw and that. and yeah. what a great character. Yeah, and yeah. the stories uh, have been fabulous. Mm -hmm. uh, f Facebook lights up whenever you guys uh, have a story to tell. And uh, yeah, we, we had you on. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, the, uh, the characters 
who who were waiting, and I'm telling you now, they're saying to me, um, fantastic show, well done, Meryl. Thanks for coming in. It's been a pleasure showcasing your experience and your journey. I told you we'd run out of time. <laughs> you're right. You're I right. promised you, and I was right again. No, you're right. But it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And we look forward to next week when we have uh, the Queensland boy, Nick Meredith, on. Can you believe it? Meredith. Nicky. On air. I had, on some air battle, I had some battles with Nicky back in the day. So he used to kick me around a few times. No. I'm sure he's kicked, no, them, he's kicked a few. And he's I still kicking them on Twitter. I think we might, we might replay this moment for him. No, replay it for him. And get him to respond. No, you'll remember. He's kicked me a few times. But it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. G1, G2, thanks for having me. Goran Lozanovsky, thank you. Brilliant. Awesome. Thanks, man. You're absolutely right, man. That did fly. You're absolutely right. FNR, Football Nation Radio. Bucciannis, no call! Score! Salamini for Cole. Cole on the run. Shoots. 2 0. Lazanowski with the free kick. Launches the rockets! Trimboli, what vision! Math blasts. Yes, a ditch! Miljevic. Here's Bazanic. Pioneers with George Denikian and George Kotsanis on FNR Football Nation Radio.